The first Castlevania game on the Game Boy was a belting first-year title that was a real standout amidst terrible sports games and mildly interesting puzzlers, although it was not without its issues. One of the biggest problems was the pacing of the game. Everything was slow and delayed even for Castlevania standards. The concept, even as simple as it was in the 80s, was still more stripped back, with no sub-weapons to use and only a small handful of enemies to fight. These issues are drawn into even sharper relief when Castlevania The Adventure is measured alongside Belmont's Revenge. Story-wise, this is nothing new for the franchise, with the cyclical nature of the seemingly never-ending Transylvanian sagas giving birth to generation after generation of vampire killers. Set 15 years after the events of the first Game Boy game, Dracula has once again returned. This time, he's kidnapped Christopher Belmont's son, Soleil, at his coming-of-age feast, and has proceeded to turn the poor sod into a demon. Having imbibed Soleil's mystical powers, Dracula was able to return to human form and reconstruct his castle, forcing Christopher to crack the old whip out again to save his son and the world. The main issue of speed was understood and addressed. It's much better here. You move at a really reasonable pace that's back on a par with the NES games, like it should be. The controls are modelled on the original trilogy, of course, even though this game came out only a few months before Super Castlevania IV on the Super Nintendo. Eight directional whipping, grapple hook techniques and backwards walking would have been far too ambitious, probably. At first, you have a gorgeous level select screen with four sub-castles to choose from. Crystal Castle, Plant Castle, Rock Castle and Cloud Castle. Each one is a long, sprawling level with occasional multiple paths, each with a final boss. Once all four have crumbled to dust, Dracula's real castle, Castlevania, rises up out of the debris. You head through two stages in Castlevania, followed by the usual final showdown. Each stage has unique music and visuals, and as I say, they always culminate in a boss. You can tell when the bosses are close as the music changes to a very ominous, slightly quieter motif that speaks of serious danger just down the next corridor. The bosses are brilliant. They look outrageous in every sense of the word and are incredibly inventive, with the majority being monstrous Hammer Horror-esque freaks, but with a couple of brilliant constructions built into the walls of the end room. One is a pair of minotaur-like statues called Cumulo and Nimbler, who stab at you with massive tridents. Despite their names, and the fact that it mistakenly states so in the manual, they're not actually the guardians of Cloud Castle. The freakish construction that does greet you at the end of that stage is the best boss I've ever seen in a Game Boy game. I mean that wholeheartedly. Angel Mummy features a giant edifice with massive bone dragons, one with a human skull and one with a dragon's, protruding out top and bottom with a face in between. The face fires projectiles at you, but what's really cool are these dragons. They share vertebrae and ribs and fire them in an arc at you between each other. As the top one has them, its skull is further out and is the one to aim for but as it boomerangs them down to the lower one, it retreats further backwards, and vice versa. A real inventiveness that we saw all too infrequently. When you finally get to Castlevania, the bosses don't get any easier. There is a Grand Serpent, which is a brilliantly crafted but agonizingly painful dragon slash snake thing in a narrow, auto-scrolling corridor that flies from ceiling to floor and back, causing a ton of damage if it hits you. Due to the automatic movement of the level, there are places where you simply have to take damage if you aren't positioned correctly. You'll need to memorize when to stand in front of the beast's emergence and when behind. It'll test your perseverance so hard, but believe me when I say the satisfaction when you finally beat that mother is enough to make you yelp out loud on a crowded train, much to the chagrin of your sister sat next to you. There are a couple of stages and bosses after that, I won't spoil the story, but they're not as hard as the serpent. God, I love and hate that thing so much. Your whip can be improved by collecting orbs. The first one extends your length, and the second gives you a very useful fireball projectile. That's not all. The secondary weapons, well, two of them, are here too. Pressing up and B gives you the ability to fire a battle axe in an arc. 
Strangely, this is replaced by a straight-firing dagger in the Japanese version, but the battle axe is better anyway. And the famous holy water that spreads napalm-like fire on the ground is great to see. This is always useful. You can quite famously cheese the final boss in the first Castlevania game with it, but in Belmont's Revenge it has a special use too. There are these human-sized eyeballs that roll along, dealing a ton of damage. You can jump over them if you're particularly dexterous and they're coming towards you, but the first instinct is to whip them. This is often fine, except that they explode. There's a section on one of the stages where you're walking along a rope bridge with the eyeballs following you. Making them explode takes out sections of the bridge as well, leaving you a potentially tricky task to get along. The holy water will destroy them without demolishing your path, so is much safer. As you'll no doubt remember from Castlevania the Adventure, the movement was achingly slow at times. It's much better here, making the game much more playable. There are still no stairs, but lots more rope sections. These were incorporated into the game mechanics more inventively now. It's possible to descend ropes really quickly by holding B. I hope Christopher is wearing gloves, else he's not going to have any skin left on his palms. You need to do this too sometimes, as in one particularly memorable part, there's no other way to avoid a giant, encroaching spike wall otherwise. You have to quickly slide down and jump off before getting thoroughly minced. The game stands really well on its own, of course. It's a truly accomplished work. But what I appreciate most of all is that Konami took what was already a good game and fixed all the nagging little problems. What they ended up creating is a venerable masterpiece. Best 8-bit Castlevania game? Tough call, but maybe? It's gotta be right up there. My favorite game out of the entire Game Boy library? Oh, there's little doubt about that at all. Unless there's something later on that I'm not aware of, this is my personal treasured title out of my entire collection. Hats off to Konami for pretty much every Game Boy game they made in 1991. This, Parodius, Gradius, The Interstellar Assault, and Operation C remain four of the best games that the Game Boy had. Thanks so much for watching this video. Let me know your thoughts on the game down below, and if you can spare a second, give the review a quick thumbs up, it really helps out. Subscribe to the Portable Power Podcast for a new Game Boy review every day from Monday to Friday. Or alternately, new episodes of the podcast drop every Saturday and Sunday on whichever platform you get your pods. See you later on.